Okay, so today we're going to start our um, treatment of MRI and just a little bit of word on the course logistics. So um, I will probably for most of the lectures, there will be a, um, a pre-lecture quiz um, similar to the one you had today. Uh, those are meant, they'll generally be three to five questions just to get you sort of warmed up for the material. And in for this one, because, you know, it's the first MRI uh, lecture, I had you look at some other videos. For upcoming uh, pre-lecture quizzes, it, it'll most likely be, you know, there might be one additional small video to watch, but most of it will be reviewing the material from the previous lecture, uh, just to give you a chance to sort of consolidate your learning from the previous lecture. All right. So just so to keep an eye out for that. So each lecture, there will typically be a pre-lecture quiz, a very small pre-lecture quiz. All right, so let's get started. Um, so today we're going to go over really sort of the basics of what an MRI system looks like, talk about spin magnetization, uh, something called precession, uh, RF excitation, and then get into uh, relaxation and transverse longitudinal components and block equation. So the chapters in the book, which have, go over these, are listed um, here. And, and so if you need more uh, background reading, you can certainly take a look at those sections. So can everyone, everyone can see the slides okay? Is that right? Sure. Yes. Yes. Yeah, great. Okay. So um, this is what an MR system looks like, or this is the most common design for MR system. We'll show, show some other designs later. Uh, but the basic idea is, uh, the largest part of the system is this magnet here. So this has, as we'll talk about, this is what creates the main magnetic field. Um, let's see, oh, we have a new link. Yeah, okay. Um, and um, the, um, so that, that main coil, <coughs> the biggest part of the magnet is, is to create that main magnetic field. Then we have, so also have a smaller call, coil called the radio frequency coil that goes inside the main coil. And then we also have a set of what are called gradient coils. So in MRI, there are actually three different uh, coils that we'll be talking about. Uh, then there's this patient table, very similar to CT, where the subject lies on the table and then goes into the magnet SO. So this is a, um, a picture of um, what the uh, Cross section of a of a winding um, from a superconducting magnet. So typically, it uses superconducting material. This is niobium titanium, and these are embedded in a copper core. So this is what like one of the wires uh, would look like. And so, basically, you have a lot of these wires uh, to create this magnetic field, and then it's bathed in helium to keep it at very low temperatures because we're counting on the superconducting properties such that there's almost uh, basically zero resistance to the wires once they're superconducting. And so what happens is when you have the magnet installed, uh, once it's sited at your facility, then there's a ramp up period where they essentially plug it into the wall and slowly the current ramps up and the field gets stronger. And then once they're done, they essentially unplug the magnet and uh, let, let it there. and um, um, and, and then the field stays where it is and it's just sort of freely running current. Okay. So yes, there's a question. Uh, yes, the, the, the cross section is this, this outer part here is the copper and the stuff inside is the uh, niobium titanium. Hey Tom, is the picture yes. showing three different coils that are all like have their own circuit or is it one continuous coil? You mean this picture on the left? The top right. There's oh, this one here? Coins. Yeah, no, that is, um, what you're seeing there is, um, it's just one coil and there actually might be on this coil, I'm not, I'd have to go back and look at the, um, where, where the slide was from. As we'll talk about before, there can sometimes be counter lighting coils to um, reduce what are called the fringe field. So I don't, I don't remember offhand what that's showing, but it, it is, it's essentially one coil. Um, and it's the, the idea is it's typically a solenoidal coil to create a, a fairly uniform field within. But as you'll see in, in a few slides, there is a counter winding coil that we will use to sort of reduce the, what are called the fringe fields. 
let's talk a little bit about uh, field units. So um, uh, we typically talk about the main field and units of Tesla. And then the smaller fields will sometimes use Gauss or sometimes we'll use, so Tesla is represented with a T. So you'll see uh, Tesla used, you'll also see us talk about micro, milli Tesla and micro Tesla. Um, and then we'll also talk about Gauss. Okay, so just to give you a sense of the fields we're dealing with, one Tesla equals 10,000 Gauss. Uh, the Earth's field is about 0 0.5 Gauss uh, or 50 micro Teslas. And so one Tesla is essentially 20,000 times the Earth's magnetic field, okay? And as you'll see, uh, for example, at our center, we have three Tesla magnets. So that's 60,000 times the Earth's magnetic field. So these are very, very powerful magnets. Uh, this is a picture of the magnet we have, for example, at our center. So it's a 3T. This is sort of uh, standard for very high-end clinical magnets right now. Three Tesla is that uh, is a standard. Uh, for research, there are now 7T magnets that are FDA cleared. And the highest field magnet that I think is working is this 10.5 Tesla magnet uh, at the University of Minnesota. There are higher field magnets, but from last I heard, they're not quite yet working very well. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about why people keep building bigger magnets, but the, the main reason is, um, as we'll see, is you get more sensitivity uh, as the magnet uh, field in increases. As you saw from the safety video, um, this is a very strong magnetic field and uh, it should not be underestimated. And these are some pictures of these two pictures. This picture and this picture are uh, pictures of you know, uh, gurneys being sucked into the magnet. And this one, unfortunately, is, is a person who actually got trapped. Um, I think he survived, but uh, he did have some injuries. So um, as part of your pre-lecture quiz, you watch this video. And uh, the main thing I want you to get, even if you remember nothing else, is the magnet is always on. I mean, that's 99.9% .9 true. I mean, sometimes we do have to turn the magnet off if there's an uh, accident or replacing a magnet. But for typical operating procedures, 24 seven, the magnet's always on. And that's because it takes a long time to ramp it up. And then once it's ramped up, we let the current just flow. There's no way we can turn it on and off very easily. There's so much energy stored in that magnetic field that uh, we just leave it on all the time. And because it's superconducting, it's not really taking any extra energy to keep it at field, all right? So uh, if you are ever, uh, most of you will probably have an MRI in your lifetime or work around an MRI, uh, just make sure you realize the magnet is always on. Okay, so it is always quite dangerous um, and you should never um, uh, have bring anything ferromagnetic into the uh, field. And, and likewise, if you happen to be lying in the magnet and see someone bringing something in, you need to tell them to stop immediately. Um, some questions when bringing, yeah, so in terms of what's safe, um, you know, everything just has to be really tested before you bring into the magnet room. So we make sure that, uh, we, there are fairly strict standards in terms of making sure that things are not ferromagnetic. And so, um, it essentially it, it, unless it's quote magnet safe, you're not allowed to bring it into the room. And the energy, yeah, so the energy is stored in the magnetic field. So from basic e &M, once you have a magnetic field and given the current and the volume, there is some stored magnetic field in there. Um, and putting an object into the field, um, you know, if you bring an object into the field, it will certainly be pulled in and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, there's so much energy there that what you're doing is, is almost negligible. Okay, so as we talked about before, um, you know, we have the main field here. So this is sort of creating the main, and we call it V0 is typically what we call it. And these are what are called counter windings. So if the current's going one way in the main field, it'll typically go the other way in these counter windings to reduce the, the magnetic field. Um, and so this is an example, this is actually from a, uh, a GE magnet layout. So this is for three Tesla magnets. So within here in the field at the center and this, the center of the magnet is called the isocenter. Okay. And you can see that's three Tesla. So that's uh, 
um, let's see, did I get that right? 30,000 Gauss? Yeah, 30,000 Gauss, okay? So 30,000 Gauss is a lot, and we don't want those fields to extend much beyond the magnet. And so you'll see here that these are, this is a picture of the fringe fields, and you can sort of see that here, as we go out in this direction, the fields are falling off fairly strongly, such that here it's 2,000 Gauss, and over here, about 16 and a half feet away from the magnet, you're down to five Gauss. And it's basically required that the, the, the five Gauss line of the magnet has to be within a safe area. That, um, and, and the reason for that is, um, although it's not clear what the actual limit is, there is, there's been this rule for a long time where anyone with a pacemaker has to stay outside the five Gauss line. Now that might not be true for modern pacemakers, but certainly in the old days, if you walk through, so as you can sort of see, this is a spatially varying magnetic field. And so if you walk through a spatially varying magnetic field, you're gonna induce a time varying magnetic field, which is gonna cause currents, which could cause your pacemaker to go haywire. And so for that reason, there's always this sort of safety limit where we have to maintain the five Gauss line um, within our uh, area. So this is actually from some design, we're looking at installing a new magnet right now. And, and you can sort of see here, we're actually having a problem because here's the, the back of the building here. And according to this, the five Gauss lines can extend out behind the back of the building. And so right now we're actually looking at what we're gonna do to maintain that five Gauss line so it doesn't extend out behind the back of the building. Uh, because otherwise, if someone's walking here or running here, um, they could very easily um, you know, trigger some currents in their body, especially if they're running fast. So we're gonna try having you guys go into breakout rooms now. And I'm gonna, uh, give you a, um, uh, this is the thought experiment I'd like you to think about. So this here is the isocenter of the magnet, all right? And what I want you to think about is, let's say you're standing here and you're holding, like in the video, you're holding a big metal wrench, okay? You weren't supposed to bring it in, but you are. So you're, you've got some metal wrench there, all right? And um, so what I want you to think about is, um, as you know, probably this, the magnet will be, there's going to be a force on the magnet exerted. Um, and uh, to answer the question, how much force would be applied by a 30 gauss field to metal object like the wrench? It's actually not the field that matters. It's the change in the field. So it's the dB, say dz, it's the change in field. And so it depends on how quickly those fields are changing. And it depends on each magnet. Uh, but as you can see, as you saw from the video, I mean, close to that magnet, there was 50 pounds of force. Um, it's typically, I would say it's typically on the order of 50 to uh, 100 pounds of force. And it's very misleading because you can be three feet away from the magnet and not feel much. You can take one step forward and all of a sudden the force changes rapidly and, it, it, and things will be pulled out before you even know it, okay? So what I want you to think about is if, for example, you are so unlucky as to have a magnet pulled, a, a wrench pulled out of your hands into the magnet, uh, where is it going to go next? Is it going to go to B, C, D, or E? Okay. And then what happens after it, it goes there? Okay. So there's going to be two destinations for the magnet. So when we, well, when you come back from the breakout room, we'll have a poll. And so the, guy, the, the question will be, what's the first destination? And then what's the second destination? Okay, there's two major destinations for this for this wrench. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna try this sending you guys into breakout rooms. Um, let's see. It's gonna be two to three participants per room. All right, so here we go.
So if you're not in a breakout room, please go to a breakout room. Okay, so you're coming back from the breakout room. Um, you'll, you should see a poll. And so you can just select the best answer for the first destination. Okay, so if you're just coming back from the breakout room, um, go ahead and look at the poll and you can select your answer. So the question is where is going to hit first or last? Uh, um, yeah, think about where the first is. I mean, let's say we are time zero at time like one millisecond or less, where will, where will it go? Where will it move to next? Like, it'll be, it'll be very fast. So there'll be a clear destination where it's gonna go. Okay. Or, or another way of saying it, it's gonna go somewhere and stop for a fraction of a second. So Tom, this answer is, where does it go to First, that's what we're answering right now with this poll. Yeah, once it gets ripped out of your hand, right? Where does it go to first? Yeah, okay. where does it go to first? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we're waiting for a few people. So if you haven't put your answer in, just go ahead and do it in the, like, the next 10 or 15 seconds. Yeah, this poll is not graded. Don't worry about it. Okay. So I'm gonna end the poll now. And here are the results. Everyone can see the results. So it looks like the overwhelming answer was B. Um, so let's think about this. So, you know, just before you, you're holding on to this and there's some force exerted on this magnet. So there's some potential energy, right? I mean, you, there's some potential energy in the system. And so as you, where, where else in the system is there gonna be the same amount of potential energy? 
So this uh, magnet is symmetric. You mean compared to A or B? Yeah, A. So A is the starting point. So if A is where you you are, where is it going and to that, be? That should be E. Yeah. So what's going to happen actually is this 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 wrench, assuming it doesn't, it's 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 fairly straight, is going to go straight through the magnet and stop right here. Okay. So it will go to E. And now let's we're going to relaunch the pole. And now I'd like you to tell me the, the, the next destination of the magnet of, of the of the wrench. So you can go ahead and enter that right now. Like where it ends up eventually. The very next uh, important destination of it. Yeah. And, and it's especially important from the point of view of this person. Right, so let me do 10 more seconds and we'll end the poll. Okay, so most of you said that it's gonna go, once it's here, it's gonna go straight back to A. And yes, that that is in the ideal case where you know it doesn't hit the walls of the magnet, that is what's going to happen. And so this is a very dangerous situation to be in and, and actually know people who have almost lost a finger because of this. And, and even very experienced people sometimes forget and, and they have something magnetic um, in their hands and it will be pulled out of your hand and come back before you can even blink. Okay. So just to emphasize just sort of how, how dangerous these magnets are and, and that you always need to sort of be careful when you're around an MRI system. Um, if there's no more questions, we'll move on. Uh, one of the things as we talked about is there's a lot of um, liquid helium used. Uh, and as some of you may know, there are shortages of liquid helium. Um, it's a finite supply of liquid helium. Um, and so classic magnet technology might use 1500 liters of liquid helium. And uh, the current designs are very efficient. I mean, they try to recover the helium as it boils off. They'll try to recondense it. Uh, but still, um, it is a lot of liquid helium. So there are companies, this is from Philips a couple of years ago, looking at designs where they can use um, less liquid helium. Um, mostly for this class, we're going to talk about this classic design, which is a solenoidal design. Uh, but there are other designs, uh, for example, there's this sort of two coils on either side of your design, which is good for if you want to look at people, uh, you know, sitting or standing. And so if you want to look at sort of, you know, lower back pain and things like that, um, that's useful. And then there's also these sort of horizontal uh, open field uh, magnets, which um, are also useful um, because they can, um, uh, you know, they, they reduce sort of claustrophobia in, in, in the magnet environment. Uh, but in terms of very high field strength, you know, all the high field strength magnets um, are, are uh, solenoidal design. And, and just for the, uh, for this course, we'll, we'll focus on sort of, um, you know, the, we'll, we'll, that that's sort of what we'll focus on. Okay. So, um, as we've talked about, there's lots of different kinds of coils. So we've, we've sort of gone over this, this main coil here, which is the B naught field. Uh, the next thing we wanna talk about is the RF coils. So there's an RF coil here, and this actually also is an RF coil, and these are also RF coils, All right? So these are basically uh, gonna be used to transmit and receive energy into the uh, sample and receive it back from the sample. Uh, this is an example of what an RF coil looks like. This is what's called a birdcage coil. It sort of looks like a birdcage. Okay. Uh, the job of, so we're going to first talk about the role of the transmit. So the, the first role of the coil is to transmit energy into the, um, into, the, uh, into the body. And so we've talked about this main field here already. So that's typically called the B0 field. This next field we're going to talk about is this. So this is the RF 
field. And so that's typically given the nomenclature, the B1 field. And as you can see, it's, it's perpendicular to the main field. And we'll talk about why that might be the case uh, later on in the lecture. Um, and, and so, um, the, uh, you know, you can, and you can create this field with a very simple loop as shown here. And so if we ran current through this and we all, essentially the idea is if you had current in this, this would create a field that's, you know, uh, a linear field. So as you uh, increase and decrease the current in that coil, the field would go back and forth and back and forth um, there. And so that's what's called a linear coil. Uh, it turns out it's a little more efficient if we can make the field go around in a circle, okay? So, um, and that is gonna be sort of uh, something we'll talk about when we talk about RF excitation. So that's um, the, so typically uh, for a very common um, mode of using it is the RF coil. You'll have what's called the body coil, which is a big coil that sits around the body. And that's what's called an RF transmit coil. And the one thing that's very popular now is then to have an array of receive only coils. And so these are gonna be the coils that actually listen to the uh, magnetization in the body. And, and that's what we're going to uh, do our imaging with. And so these are some examples here of some receive only coils. So those are typically only just for listening to the energy. Uh, these are some other examples. And you can sort of see there's a wide array of, of coils that people do and and um, and there's always innovation in this area. I, for, I should probably, um, there are even now sort of coils that are flexible, so you can actually make clothes out of these coils. And the idea is you could just put on a jacket and the, the, um, the jacket would have the coils embedded in it. So you wouldn't even have to worry about placing these coils on your subject. Uh, later on in the lecture, we'll talk about, you know, how you not, you won't just use one of these coils, but you use an array of these coils. And so you have many, many coils and that's, that helps us do the imaging a little faster. And so you see here, you see some examples of arrays, including this this sort of huge array that covers the entire uh, body of, of the uh, patient. Uh, and um, these are uh, head coils. So these are coils that go over your head and these both have 32 uh, coils in them. And just to give you a sense of sort of the evolution of technology, this is the prototype version of this coil when it was built at uh, Harvard uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. And over many, many iterations, this is sort of the final product that is now sold on, on Siemens machines. Okay. So in the prototype, you can sort of see there's basically what's called a soccer ball design. There's sort of these, all these little coils there, each sort of independently picking up um, a signal. Uh, the last set of coils we're gonna talk about are the MRI gradient coils. And there's gonna be three of these. There's gonna be an X gradient, a Y gradient, and a Z gradient. And these are to um, create gradients in the magnetic field. So um, as you saw in the pre-lecture videos and in the quiz, the job of the main field that we talked about, so the B naught field, we want it to be spatially homogeneous, right? Okay, and uniform. And also it's static, okay? So in your quiz, you saw it, those were sort of the questions. And so that, that was basically the ideal B naught field, the, the big field that we have, the, the ideal field will be uniform. So wherever you go, it should be the same field. And it's also not gonna change over time. Okay, so that's the ideal B naught field. The gradients actually are gonna be quite different. They are going to vary over space. So they create a field that varies with space and also changes with time. So they have a very different role and they're gonna be critical for how we actually make images with MRI. Uh, this is sort of, I think this is from the Siemens factory, sort of a, a, a picture of, of what a, a gradient coil looks like. So what are gradients? Well, essentially for this course, we're gonna focus on what we call linear gradients. These basically just create a linear change in the field as you go across space. So what we would say is the field, and we're typically only gonna look, think about the Z component of the field is going to be the uniform field, the B naught, plus this field that changes with X, this component that changes with Y, 
and this component that changes with Z. Okay. And we de denote those as GX, GY, and GZ. So to give you a sense of what that is, if I have a GZ field, a linear gradient in Z that's greater than zero, that means as I move along the Z direction, the field's getting stronger. So you can sort of see as we go in this direction, along the Z direction, this, the, v, the Z component of the field is getting stronger. Here, we're looking at where GY is greater than zero. And so here, we're moving, as we move along in the Y direction, we're still looking at the Z component. And you can sort of see as we move along in this component, that BZ field is getting larger. And so that would be a positive uh, GZ gradient. Uh, the way, the general principle for making these gradients is to have two coils of, for example, in the Z direction of one, you'd have one coil with current going one way, the other coil with current going the other way. And so uh, if you do that, so this has current going this way, this has current going this way. So they create opposing fields and such that in the middle, they'll cancel out. And so you can end up with a, um, a time, a spatially varying uh, gradient. Uh, and the same principle, you can extend that to X, Y uh, gradients. And as you can see, they, they have very interesting designs. And it's the sort of designing gradients as a whole subspecialty on its own that sort of requires a lot of expertise. Um, the other thing about gradients is they use a ton of power. So um, to give you a sense of what a gradient amplitude is, and we'll talk about this more as we go in the course, um, you know, a gradient amplitude might be five gauss per centimeter. So that means over one millimeter, it's changing half a gauss or a, you know, the Earth's size of the Earth's magnetic field in one millimeter. Um, so that's how much the, the magnetic field is changing. And the slew rate or the rise time, the slew rate is how fast it's changing and the rise, uh, the slew rate is the slope of, of the change. So for example, if I'm going from zero to say five, the slew rate would be the slope, okay? And the rise time is how fast I can make that change. So in this case, um, if I have a five gauss per centimeter gradient and a slew rate of 200 Tesla per meter per second, that means I'm making that transition in 250 microseconds. So, so very quick. Um, and the idea there is that, as you'll see later on in the course, we turn these gradients on and off. Okay, and so they're always constantly changing. And that requires these very super powerful gradients, uh, gradient amplifiers. And typically state of the art now is to use a one megawatt amplifier per channel, okay? So in, the, um, in your equipment room, you'll, you'll see that we have these huge amplifiers that are, that are powering these gradient coils. And just to give you a sense of how much uh, current that is, how much power that is, um, the, and, and these gradient amplifiers are uh, basically uh, acting at the audio frequency. And so it turns out that the switching on and off of these gradients happens in the audio band. So you can actually use these gradients as we'll see later to actually make sounds. And uh, to give you a sense of how much power that is, um, this was a while since I looked this up, but I think in the Metallica 2017 world tour, hopefully some of you know who Metallica is, um, the total number of watts for the audio, and this was for like, you know, if you wanna have a rock concert in a big stadium, was 367,000 uh, watts. And so only about a third of the power in one of these gradient amplifiers. So, uh, you know, if you didn't use a gradient amplifier for MRI, you could actually, you know, give it to a rock band and, and they could use it for their concerts, okay? Okay, so to sum up, and the idea is we're gonna give you sort of an overview of what things look like now. And then uh, as uh, over the next few lectures, we're gonna go into detail as to what each component is. So. Uh, this is what a MRI, so you sort of see the MRI system here. Uh, typically the operator will sit outside um, and operate the scanner. And this is what the scanner interface looks like. And so you can sort of see here that um, there's gonna be a lot of electronics. And so for example, all this stuff is to power the gradients. And so that's gonna go into the gradient coils. And here is the RF transmit and receive. So that's gonna go to the RF coil. And you'll notice here, and this is what really makes MRI very unique is that there's an ability to pulse program. So you actually have a lot of control over how these fields are changing. And the manufacturers 
are very are quite open about allowing you to get in and, and create any program you want. And so that's made MRI a very rich area for academic research. And in fact, many of the innovations um, in MRI over the past um, you know, 30 to 40 years uh, have come from um, grad students, postdocs, faculty members in academia coming up with ideas and then industry will take those ideas and, and implement them. So, and that's really because they've, they've created this open environment um, where uh, you can actually make the MRI system do whatever you want to do. Okay, so now we're gonna sort of switch gears a little bit and start talking about what each component does in a little more detail. Um, so the magnet, um, as you saw in the pre-lecture video, its main job is polarization, okay? Its main job is to polarize the magnetization to create sort of a net magnetization that you can use. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. Yeah, the question is, are, are MR systems more open source and CT more corporate? Yeah, I, I think, you know, if that's certainly true. There, it's, it's much more open. Now, it's not open source in the sense that you still have to have an agreement with each vendor, um, you know, to be able to get access to their software environment. But there are even, for example, efforts, open source software, where you can write, you know, your software in MATLAB and then try to port it to any vendor systems, as long as you have the agreement with the vendor to do that. Um, the next thing we're talking, so the next, that's one coil, then the RF coils transmit, and that's, its job is excitation. Okay, so that's going to be something where we actually um, take that polarization, and we're going to actually tip that magnetization away from its equilibrium point of view. So that process is called excitation. The gradient coils then come and its job is encoding. Okay, and so that's gonna take the magnetization and in different space, different places in space, it's gonna make the magnetization move in different ways. And that's gonna allow us to do our imaging. Whoops. And the final step is integration or, or reception, which is basically this receiver coil now listens to all the magnetization within a volume, okay? And that integration, as you know, remember from the Fourier transform, you always have this integral of say mx, e to the minus j, two pi, kx, x, dx, let's say. So the gradients sort of do this, okay? And this RF coil, when it's receiving, does this integration, and we'll see that later. So. What we're going to work up to is that this MRI system is actually going to be able to do the Fourier transform of our objects for us. And, uh, and these are the steps that it needs to take. So polarization, excitation, encoding, and integration. And so that's, we're going to start now by looking at uh, polarization, uh, and then we'll get into precession. And then as we go through the course, what we're going to find out is, um, even though MRI was initially just used for looking at anatomy over the, the many decades of development, you know, there's been really amazing things that have been done with MRI where you can use it to look at, you know, vasculature, you can use it to look at, you know, so much how much iron is in the blood vessels, you can use it to look at the wiring of your brain, and you can even use it to look at how your brain is changing in time, you know, how, how your brain is functioning. So um, it's, it's, it's a fairly incredible technology that, that um, has a lot of applications. So now we're gonna sort of dive a little deeper and we're gonna talk first um, about spin and polarization and precession. Okay. So uh, we're only gonna very briefly just sort of give you sort of the basics that you need to know. We're, you know any one of these topics is, is, is got a lot of depth to it. So uh, we're not gonna dive into too much detail. Um, but spin, as some of you may know, is considered the intrinsic angular momentum of elementary particles. And it's a key concept in quantum mechanics. Now, one way to think about it, which is you know, sort of a useful classical analogy, is you can think of something like a proton. Let's say there was a proton which has a positive charge. And if it's spinning around its own axis, right, then it's going to have that spinning is sort of its angular momentum. All right. And then since it's a charged sphere and it's spinning around its own axis, then that is going to be essentially a current. And so that's also going to give rise to a magnetic field. Okay, so we're going to find out that there's two things that these um, particles have. They have intrinsic angular momentum, and they also have um, a magnetic uh, moment or field associated with them. 
And both those things are gonna be important for understanding how spins behave. So um, there are different types of spin you can have. In, in this class, we're really gonna focus on these spins here, uh, which have uh, a multiple of a half spin. And in particular, we're gonna focus on the hydrogen proton. So as we talked about, um, talk a little bit about, you know, sort of a magnetic moments, just to refresh um, your, your concepts on this, which is imagine if we had a coil and we had current going through it. Uh, then from the right hand rule, if I, you know, apply my right hand around the current direction that my thumb points in the, uh, the, the magnetic field position. So that's gonna create a magnetic moment that has um, for a given current, an area, uh, it's going to create a magnetic moment with this n hat being the direction vector that's pointing in, in the direction um, uh, indicated there. Um, so the idea is that if I have, imagine I had a really big magnetic field. Okay, so that's sort of, I've got all, I've got a coil in the magnetic field. And the idea is that if I have current going in this direction, it has this magnetic moment. And in this case, the magnetic moment's aligned with the field. And that turns out to be the lowest energy state for that coil. And if I were to, if I had to flip that coil around, that's gonna create energy, just require energy to flip that coil around. I'm gonna be working against the field. And that's gonna mean that in the bottom, when it's pointing in the bottom direction, when the magnetic moment is pointing against the magnetic field, that's gonna be my maximum energy state. And so there's this idea that depending on the orientation of the magnetic moment with the main field, there's different energy states. And in between, you can have, for example, this energy state where it's sort of in between uh, the two uh, uh, energy states that are, are shown um, at the top and the bottom. Um, so the most common example of that is uh, if you have a compass needle, right? And the Earth's magnetic field, it's going to align with the field. And then if you take a compass needle and you move it to point south, uh, it's not gonna stay there. It's gonna go back to north, okay? So the compass needle is in its lowest energy state when it's pointing north and then highest energy state when it's pointing south. Um, and so that what that means is if you have, um, let's say in the presence of a B-naught field, you're gonna have a distribution at, at, at a given temperature where there's sort of random motion of spins or particles, then it's gonna, the, there will be some in the highest energy state. So, so this is sort of the highest energy state. And then there's gonna be some in the lowest energy state. And there's gonna be a bunch of spins in intermediate energy states. And that's gonna follow a, a Boltzmann distribution. So an exponential distribution. Um, for those of you not familiar with the Boltzmann distribution, I mean, one way to think about it is if you think about like a, um, a car garage and uh, let's say there's no parking permits and you can park anywhere you want. And typically, if you look at a parking garage, you know, it, the least energy is to park on the lower levels and it takes a lot of energy to drive up to the top level. So there should be a rough exponential occupancy of the floors as you're going up, all right? There's always gonna, there'll be a few at the top. Someone, you know, with a lot of energy might wanna go park at the top, but in general, most people will sort of fill in the lower levels, right? Did so it turns out, now, go ahead. Sorry, I, uh, I was going to say, could you explain again where a particle would be in the highest energy state? Yeah, this would be the highest energy state. Oh, I was thinking on the last slide, like which orientation? Like what's the frame of reference here? This one here? Which slide? Okay, so you're referring to, okay, it's a particle in a, in a magnetic field that is spinning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, gotcha. at this point, it's not spinning yet. It's just if anytime you have, it's sort of like your, it's the compass example, right? If you have a field, an external field, and you have a, something with a, a magnetization to it, it's going to be its lowest energy state when it's pointing along that field. Okay, gotcha. So we haven't talked about spinning at all yet. Yeah, but that's a good question. So the bottom line is that um, the... Uh, you know, without a without a uh, applied magnetic field, then sort of any random orientation of the magnetic moments is okay. And so, 
if you assume that all these little vectors are these little magnetic moments and you assume you took their tails and just put them all together and you make this little, like, like a cush ball, then because they're all pointing in different directions, they're all gonna cancel out. So the net magnetization of this system here is gonna be zero. Okay, so this, this is gonna have M equal to zero. Now, once you put it, now once you take that sample and you put it into a, a magnetic field, then there's gonna be preferred orientation for slightly more magnet, more particles will be in the up position versus the down position or any other position, okay? And as you make that field stronger and stronger, then there's gonna be more of a differentiation between the, the, uh, the lowest field, the lowest energy and the, and the largest and the highest energy. So there's gonna be even more preferential uh, population pointing along the, the main magnetic field. And so that's what's termed equilibrium magnetization. And as you can sort of see, it depends on the number of spins there, but it's also linear proportional to the magnetic field that we apply. Okay, and so that's this process of going from here to here, that's what we mean by polarization. We're creating this net magnetization uh, that we're gonna work with next. And the reason why people keep building these bigger magnetic MRI systems with larger fields is because the bigger the field you have, the bigger that polarization is. And so you have more signal to work with. Okay. So the next thing we wanna talk about is torque. And this is how a spin acts uh, with the magnetic field. So previously, let's just say, assume that this is the main magnetic field pointing in this direction. And let's say this is a compass needle, right? So if I just had a compass needle, it, it would go from pointing here to here, right? If I perturbed it, it would just go back to here, all right? And that's because this compass needle doesn't have any angular momentum to it, right? It's just a static object. Now I wanna take the case where let's say this compass needle is rotating around its own axis, okay? So you can imagine that. And so the question is, what happens if you have something that has both a magnetic moment, so it's magnetized, and it's also rotating around its own axis? What's gonna happen if I, do, if I put that in the presence of a magnetic field? Right. So um, here we'll start off with, here's the main field and here's mu, which is these, uh, has a magnetic moment. And in that case, there's gonna be a torque applied to that, which is gonna to try to create, so the torque N is pointing out there and you use the right-hand rule to tell you which way the thing is gonna rotate. So in that case, mu is gonna rotate mu is gonna to rotate to be aligned with B, okay? So that's the torque that's applied. And we can represent that as N equals mu cross B. The cross product of U and B gives us the torque, which causes the, the moment to go like that. Um, and then there's also gonna be that, that torque causes a change in the angular momentum, okay? Uh, but we also have a relationship between magnetic moment and angular momentum. So it turns out for spins, uh, spins tend to have this relationship too. So the more angular momentum they have, the more magnetic moment they have, okay? And so if you combine these two, you get this equation of motion, d mu dt equals mu cross gamma b. Okay. Uh, so what that means is this, that basically if I look at d mu dt, that's a change in mu as a function of time. So, uh, and that's saying that if it's mu cross B, so mu cross B is the cross product between these two. So that's gonna be a vector that's pointing orthogonal to the path. And so what this means is that if you have a something that has a magnetic moment and angular momentum, it's going to process around the main magnetic field. Right. And so that's the key. So precession happens. And in fact, it's gonna process at this particular frequency, omega equals gamma times B, where this is known as a lawnmower frequency. And this gamma is called the gyromagnetic ratio. Okay, so um, let me see, I'm gonna demonstrate this. Well, hopefully this video will work. So um, let's see. Back up. All right, so what I have is a bicycle wheel here, right? And hope you all can see that. So right now it's in its lowest energy state. So I'm holding it with a string. So gravity is the force that's pulling it down. It's in its lowest energy state. 
So it has no angular momentum. I could perturb it. So if I do this, it's in a higher energy state, right? And if I go like this, it's in its highest energy state. So it requires me to do some work. Whoops. It requires work for me to perturb it away from its low energy state. But if I did that, if I just perturb it as an angular momentum, it just goes back to its lowest energy state. Okay. Everyone see that? But if it has angular momentum, let me tie this a little better. You notice it processes around the vertical axis. Okay. So, and, and depending on which way I spin the wheel, it'll process in a different direction. Okay, so hopefully you've played with a gyroscope um, or something in, in, in your life and, or else you've ridden a bike. And so uh, this gyroscopic principle is essentially what, uh, you know, useful thing to think about as you're thinking about uh, procession of spins. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about units again. So we talked about one Tesla being 10,000 Gauss. Uh, Earth feels about half a Gauss. Uh, gamma um, is for H for hydrogen proton. It's uh, about 26,000 radians per second or um, 4,258 Hertz per Gauss or 4.42.58 megahertz per Tesla. Um, and then these are some geometric ratios. These are geometric ratios for hydrogen, sodium, phosphorus. Um, and here also we've listed the, the abundance of these, okay? So you can sort of see, obviously you have a lot of, in, in the human body, you have a lot of hydrogen as, as part of the, the water. And so from these, we can come up with a relative sensitivity. So assuming that hydrogen proton has a relative sensitivity of one, it means you can image things like sodium and phosphorus, but the, the signal you get is like a factor of 10 less. And so um, there's a real big penalty you pay. Um, and that's why uh, for the most part, um, most imaging um, is done on the hydrogen proton. And, and that's certainly what we'll talk about uh, for this course. Uh, and then just to give you a sense of the Larmor frequency. Um, so uh, the gamma is if you want the frequency in radians per second. Uh, but typically it's also useful to think about things in Hertz for cycles per second. And so for that, you know, it's, we use gamma over two pi times B. Okay, so you'll see gamma or gamma over two pi used quite a lot. And just to give you a sense of what that means is um, for a 1.5 Tesla system, which is fairly standard for uh, sort of lower end clinical work, uh, that means the frequency is about 63.86 megahertz. Okay, so that's the, that means that if you go into an MRI system, a 1.5G system, your spins are all processing around, your hydrogen protons are processing around 63 million times per second. If you went into a 3T magnet, they'd be processing about 127 megahertz. Okay. Uh, and just to give you a sense of those frequencies, you know, 1.5T, so that's like between analog TV channel and civil aviation frequency bands. So this is in so are these radio frequency bands used for those purposes? Okay, so, so far we've only been talking about an individual spin. Um, now, when we're doing imaging, we're never ever looking at just one spin particularly. Uh, we're looking at a collection of spins. And so we wanna think about sort of the magnetization vector. And so we can think about, so in this course, when we're talking about magnetization, we're really talking about thinking about the magnetization over uh, all the protons in, in a given volume. Um, and it turns out because it's a linear process, then that magnetization follows the same equation of motion. So it's dm dt equals gamma m cross p. So that just means that whether you think of uh, any one spin or um, the collection of spins, it's still processing around the main field. I think there's, yeah. So that's shown by this here where all the spins together, they're all processing around but the net magnetization also processes around, okay? 
All right, the next thing we're gonna talk about is um, radio frequency excitation. And so that's the process of taking, we've created this polarization and it turns out that it's not very useful for imaging to have the magnetization just stuck here uh, because you know, this magnetization processing around its own axis is not really creating a time varying magnetic field that we can pick up. So what we wanna do is we wanna take this magnetization and flip it away from the main axis such that now it can process around this main field. And that way, if I had a coil out here, this coil would be picking up a time varying change in the magnetic field. Okay, so it turns out that's a use, very useful for uh, the imaging process. And so that's what the excitation part is for. It's taking the, the, mag the magnetic moment, which here is aligned with the field. And in this case, this would be what's called like a 90 degree flip angle. So in that case, we've, we've flipped it 90 degrees away from its equilibrium position. We can pick any angle, but, in, but for now, for this picture, it's a 90 degree flip angle. Uh, this is a picture of what it looks like. So you have this, all this, you have each arrow is like sort of its individual spin, but the net is coming up with this net magnetization. And the idea is we're trying to get that net magnetization. So everything is processing around the field. And now we're trying to get this net magnetization to go away from the um, its equilibrium position into some other position. Okay, so that's the process of RF excitation. Um, so the way we do that is we apply this B1 field. Okay, and the idea is, um, for example, if we know that spins process around magnetic fields. So if I have a, if I had a spin here, right, and I applied a little field here, and that's the only field that it works, and this would this this spin would process around this field, so I could get it to flip down, okay. And the idea is that um, this is a very tiny field that I'm using, and and if I just apply a tiny field here, then the net and it's in the presence of a very big field, okay. So this this field is on the order of the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, so we have this big magnet, and then we come up with this, come in with this tiny field that is, let's say, fifty thousand times smaller than that field. So, in, in really, things are not going to budge. Things are going to stay aligned with this main field because if I just apply a static perturbation this way, it's not really going to cause any change. So the idea is, what can I do with a little field? What, how can I use this little field in a, in a smart way to get to to convince this magnetization to tip away from where it wants to be. So it's really held in very strongly with this main field, okay? So um, a useful thought example is this. Um, I think everyone's seen a merry-go-round, okay? Let's say you had your friend on a merry-go-round and you were able to tie a tiny thread to them, right? And you're, you're standing off of the merry-go-round. Right. Um, so, um, what could you do? What would you need to do to sort of pull your friend off the merry-go-round? You just have a little string of tied to them. They're going around on the merry-go-round. How would you? And you're only able to sort of hold the string with your like index finger and thumb. How would you pull them off the merry-go-round? Any thoughts on that? As they're like moving away from you? Yeah, so they're moving around. So what would you need to do to pull them off the merry go around? Just pull when they're moving away from you. Yeah, so you'd want to, so it's a it's a fine thread. So you, you can't, if you, if you let them go too much, the string's gonna break. So you're gonna have to run alongside of them, right? And, and run alongside with them and be sort of the same frequency as they're moving, okay, to get them off. Uh, another example would be here, if you had a big car and let's say this car is, it's hanging on this sort of, it's on a pendulum, right? And you, you can only come in with your pinky and you have to sort of hit that car and get it moving, okay? So how should you, how should you perturb that car? What frequency, what, what sort of, what pattern of pushes do you wanna use to get that car moving? 
without breaking your pinky. The same as the car. The what? The same as the car. The same what as the car? Same frequency of the movement. Yeah, the same resonant frequency, just like pushing someone on the swing. So the idea is any system where you, even if you don't have much force to apply, you, if you apply that force intelligently, you can sort of create this resonance, okay, and, and perturb the system. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Is the varying angles of the excitation, the RF excitation, does it have specific applications? Oh, you mean getting different flip angles? Yes. Yeah. It's, there are going to be, we'll see later on. Yeah, there's typically, for most of the class, we're going to pick a 90 degree flip angle just to make things simple. But there are, there are in, in practice, all different flip angles are used. And, and we'll talk about that later in the class. Okay. So yeah, stay, stay tuned. Okay, so this is the idea behind our excitation that if we can have this R, the B1 field go at the same frequency as the spin wants to process anyways, it's sort of like we're keeping up with the spin and pulling on it the whole way through, we can get it to tip over, okay? So this is an example here, this movie is showing the, the blue is the RF, the B1 field going at the same frequency as the spin. And by applying it at the same frequency that the spin wants to go anyways, we can sort of tip it over. Now here on the uh, right-hand side, you're gonna see that the, the, the blue is moving at a different frequency from the spin. And therefore, you're going to see it doesn't really tip it over. So this would be similar to if you went up to the the um, the car and pushed it at the wrong frequency, you're not going to be able to budge the car. Right? Um, so that's the idea that the, the, the spin, the B1, is applied at resonance. at a frequency gamma equal, okay? So we know that the frequency, the spins are processing at gamma times V naught. So we wanna apply this V1 field at the same frequency. Now, as we're talking about MRI, one thing we're gonna talk about a lot is the rotating frame of reference, which is that these spins are all going at 127 million times per second. But for us to keep track of that makes our lives really difficult. And so we don't really always wanna keep track of this sort of quick spinning of the spins. And so we're going to reference everything to the magnetic field at the isocenter, or at z equals zero. So typically, um, our notation is if this is the magnetic field, this is the, the MRI system, we assume the z coordinate points along the axis, and the center of the magnet is z equals zero. Okay. And the B naught field is pointing in this direction. All right. So that's our assumption. So the idea is that, you know, just like if you are, if someone, if your friend is here on the merry-go-round, if you're off, if you're in the laboratory frame watching them, it's like they're going around very quickly. But if you hop on the merry-go-round, then it looks like they're just standing still. Okay. So we're going to assume that we're going at the same speed as the spin. So instead of the spin going around, it just looks like it's standing still because we're in the rotating frame of reference. So uh, that's shown here in the laboratory frame of reference. When we excite the spin down, it looks like it spirals down. Okay. But if we go to the rotating frame of reference, then it appears that this, as the spin just comes down and just, just does the flips over like this because we're losing this sort of main precession frequency. Uh, and that's shown here in this video. So in the rotating frame of reference, it just looks like we're just tipping the spin over. And so, um, we will, for basically the rest of this course, we'll operate in this rotating frame of reference. Okay, so um, the flip angle is um, uh, basically the precession of the of the the spin. So that this B1 field the spins will want to process around it, and they're going to process at a frequency gamma times B1. All right. And so if that, um, that's the frequency, so we can get the flip angle by just integrating that frequency over time. And so that's shown here. And so as an example, let's say I had a, I turned on my field, B1. Okay. 
and it's on for 400 microseconds. And I want a flip angle of pi over two or 90 degrees. Okay. So then all the area, okay. The flip angle is just the frequency, which is gamma V1 integrated over this area. Okay. So that's going to be gamma V1 times tau. And we want that equal to pi over two. So if you go ahead and solve that, then you would get V1 equals 0.1468 Gauss. So we're going to skip over this in the interest of time. We'll, maybe we'll come to it later or, or assign as a homework assignment. Um, but this is um, uh, a slightly more complicated one where the RF pulse has the form of a sink. Okay, so you need to know what the area of a sink is to figure that out. So we'll, we will either assign this as a homework or, or visit this in, a, in an upcoming lecture. Okay, so what I wanna do in the last uh, about 13 minutes is sort of talk, talking about the Larmor equation, which is the governing equation for MRI. And so we start off with our equation of motion. So dmdt equals m cross gamma b. That's basically precession, okay? And if you go back to high school and remember what a cross product is, you remember you can describe it as a determinant and you can take the determinant of this matrix and you can end up with uh, these equations. So you have gamma times all these different cross products uh, with the i, j, k vectors, all right? And you can write that in matrix form. So you have each component dmx dt, dmy dt is equal to that. And then you can rewrite this as, uh, this matrix, uh, let's, call it, let's call this T times your magnetization. Okay, so dm dt, this matrix equals some T matrix times the original matrix. So let's talk a little bit about what the solution is. So remember, uh, as Dr. Uh, McVeigh talked about, uh, we will use phasers a lot. Uh, especially for MRI, phasers are actually the most important, one of the more important concepts. And on your homework that we'll send out tonight, uh, there'll be a, like a MATLAB exercise or to get you some sort of familiar with plotting phasers. Uh, just remember that, you know, if you have something in the form e to the j theta, you can imagine that is essentially this unit vector that has an angle of theta um, here and a magnitude of one. And so for MRI, it's really gonna be important to, re to always remember that this theta term just basically tells you the orientation of your phaser with respect to the x-axis. So this would be theta of zero, minus pi over two, pi and pi over two. Okay, so those are different examples of phasers pointing in different directions. So um, let's look at where, you know, in this expression here, we had all these fields, bz, by, bx, bz, by, bx. So initially we're going to look at the case where bx equals by equals zero. So all those terms go away. And then bz equals b naught. All right. And so that means that this is basically what's going to happen to magnetization if I have it in the presence of a magnetic field b naught. And if I do that, the, uh, the, the matrix simplifies. So it's only got the b naught and the minus b naught there. And then what we're going to define is we're going to define a complex quantity M. <coughs> this is the transverse magnetization composed of an MX plus J, where J is the imaginary number MY. Okay, so you can imagine the magnetization has got an MX component and an MY component, and we express the magnetization as a complex number. All right. So what we can do is if you plug, if we use that substitution, we can then find out that the equation of motion of this complex vector is just dm dt equals minus j gamma b naught. And that's a first order differential equation. So you know it just has a solution of e to the j something, right? So it's something that uh, you, know, you probably learned to solve either in high school or first year of college. So it turns out that the solution to that is m of t equals m zero, the initial condition times e to the minus j gamma b naught of t or m naught either minus j omega naught t where omega naught is defined as gamma b naught. So the question is which way does this rotate with time? So you know 
the, uh, the options are it could rotate this way, let's call that A, or it could rotate this way, let's call that B. Okay, so let me, since we've got the polling, let's, let's actually do that. Okay, so go ahead. You, in this case, pick either A or B. Which way is it going to rotate, A or B? Just... about 10 more seconds. So just go and take your best guess. It's just an anonymous poll. So just, if you guess at it, that's actually all we're looking for. Okay, so let's take a look at the poll. So we have 60% A and 45% B, okay. Uh, and so let's take a look at that. So if, if I look at something of the form e to the minus j omega naught t, right? That has the form of e to the j theta, right? Where theta is equal to minus omega naught t, right? So as time increases, the theta is gonna become more negative, right? So that means I'm gonna be going in this direction because this is the direction of negative phase with time, of negative phase. Remember, theta is defined going this way. So if I'm going in this direction, if the, if the phase is becoming more negative, I'm going to be going in the direction of A. So in this case, A would be the correct answer. That's important to keep in mind as we're doing, uh, as we more get more and more to MR, is to have a sense of which way the phases are going. Are they going this way or that way? And if you forget, you can always go back to this picture of, well, what's the phase at this point in time? All right. So what happens next? So we've talked about We've talked about polarization, we create the magnetization, we've talked about excitation, we excite it away from its equilibrium. The next thing that happens is then it processes around, okay? But it's not gonna process forever, right? Where does this magnetization wanna go? What's, where does, where, if I wait enough time, where should I find this magnetization at, at, let's say after, you know, a few seconds or a few minutes? It's gonna go back to equilibrium, okay? So we perturb the system, it's gonna do something, but eventually it's gotta go back to its original state, which is equilibrium. And that process is called relaxation. And, the, and so the signal we measure, um, so this, this, the, M, the MR signal, as you can sort of see, is slowly gonna die away. Um, and so this is what's called free induction decay. Also, you'll hear the term FID. Okay, so the free induction decay just means what happens if you bang the system and let it um, evolve, and what do you measure? And so what you find out is the magnetization is processing, but it sort of does this, does this death spiral in the, mag in the transverse plane back to zero. So the magnetization was initially, there was initially no magnetization in the transverse plane. We created some, but it's eventually gonna shrink back to zero. So there's actually two types of relaxation. There's T1 relaxation and there's T2 relaxation. T1 applies to the MZ component and T2 applies to the MXY components, okay? So let's talk about T1 relaxation first. So remember, this is the, this is the equilibrium value of the M sub Z component. It always wants to go back to this, this equilibrium position, right? So when I tip it away, like let's say I do a 90 degree flip angle, now it's starting it off at zero, right? Okay. So what's gonna happen is this M sub Z component is gonna gradually exponentially increase back to its equilibrium position. And it's gonna take, this can do that in an exponential fashion. So for example, after 90 degree flip angle, the M sub Z to T will recover according to this equation where T1 is the time constant, All right? Uh, this is the equation of motion or the, of, of the M sub Z component. Um, and, and it has that solution. So basically the picture in mind is no matter where I tip it, it's gonna take about 
uh, it, it recovers back to its equilibri equilibrium magnetization for the time constant of T1. So we'll talk about in a future lecture, what are the physical processes that cause this T1 relaxation? But for now, just real, just, I'm just telling you that that's what happens, that there is this recovery of a M sub Z component, okay? So when every think the longitudinal relaxation, remember we're talking about the M sub Z component. And why that matters is because different tissues actually have different T1s. When we get into the chemistry or the biophysics of it, we'll understand a little more why they have that. But because different tissues recover with different relaxation rates, it means that we're gonna be able to create images that have contrast between different tissues. The next thing we're gonna talk about is the transverse relaxation, which deals with the MXY component. Okay, and the idea is when we tip the spin, let's say here, there's no MXY component. When we tip it 90 degrees, now we've created this MXY component. Okay, so we're in this position here. And over time, that's going to reduce and shrink back to zero, okay? And this has somewhat different uh, mechanisms behind it, which we'll talk about in a future slide. Um, but it's essentially the decay of the, uh, the, the sort of the coherence of, of, the, of the different spins. And you can also show that T2 uh, is always less than or equal to T1, okay? So if you're ever given a quiz where T2 is bigger than T1, you know that that can't be the correct answer. All right, so this is something important, it's good to keep in mind. And that's because the stuff that causes T1 can also cause T2, but not vice versa, all right? So this is what a free induction decay looks like. Um, the signal in, in the laboratory frame, we are picking up this sort of, this oscillation. And so that's what's giving rise to this, this oscillation here. As, as the magnetization is going around and we're looking at it, the time variable magnetization is what we pick up. But the amplitude of that signal, the envelope is what's decaying with E to the minus T over T2. All right, so that's important to remember. And so once again, why we care about T2 is because different tissues have different T2s. Um, and so here you see gray matter has a T2 of about 100 milliseconds, fat 85 milliseconds, liver 43 milliseconds, CSF, which is cerebral spinal fluid, has a very long T2. Uh, in this case, I think it's 4,000 milliseconds, but it can vary somewhat. So because there's different tissues that have different T2s, we'll find out that we can also take advantage of that to create image contrast. So when we talk about image contrast, we're gonna be taking advantage of the T1s and the T2s. Okay. Um, and to give you a preview of what's happening is the spins are, Initially, if we think of all these spins, they're all tipped down and they're all pointing in the same direction. Over time, they sort of get out of coherence. And so if you imagine they're all in the same direction, but as they spread apart, then their net sum is going to go uh, become less. And so for example, this is showing they're all coherent here, but as they dephase, you can imagine that the net of all these spins is gonna be much smaller than this initial net magnetization. So that gives rise to the block equation, which is shown here. So the, the magnetization, at least for now, has got really three components. There's gonna be precession, the precession around the main field. And at the same time, there's gonna be relaxation in the transverse plane and relaxation in the longitudinal plane. Um, and so we can add those, these, these terms to get the, um, the, the relaxation into there. This is just saying what the, uh, the solution is. So in general, the solution for M sub Z is given here. And so if M, if we start off at zero, then it's just exponential recovery from here. If we start off at minus M zero, then it's exponential recovery from here. Okay, so this is minus M zero, and it's always recovering back to equilibrium magnetization M sub zero. And so what it looks like is this, that, and then and the transverse component is, processing, we already saw this e to the minus j omega naught t term. And at the same time, it's decaying with the e to the minus t over t2. And so what that looks like is, remember, the precession is in this direction. And as it's processing, it's also decaying. So it's like this little spiral going back to zero. And so if we watch this movie here, you can sort of see it's spiraling down. Okay. 
And you'll notice here I've got the MXY. It decays much faster typically than the M sub Z returns because remember T2 is less than T1. So if I play this movie again, notice how the MXY component decays very quickly while the, and it's almost zero while the M sub Z is still growing back. Okay, so what we've done so far is we've looked at how we create magnetization, how we excite it, and what happens to the magnetization as it's returning to equilibrium. Uh, this is the last slide, just showing you that if I start at this point, the magnetization sort of spirals down, and at the same time, the M sub Z is growing back. Okay, so sort of those two things are happening at the same time. Um, but typically, because as we said, T2 is less than T1, the spiraling in occurs much more quickly. And then at, even after it's spiraled down here, it's actually still growing back in the M sub Z component. Okay, so uh, that's the last slide I had um, for this lecture, is that right? Yeah. So um, we'll end the lecture now and um, I'll stay around um, for office hours if anyone has questions they'd like to ask, okay? Uh, and then there will be homework posted um, this evening um, for the, and it will be due actually, next Wednesday is a holiday. So it's actually, we're gonna make the due date next Thursday. So it's not due on the holiday. And then look out in your email or look for the assignments. There will be a pre-lecture quiz for um, the next lecture, which will be on Monday, which will be mostly based on material that we went over today. All right, so um, that's the end of today's lecture and uh, I can stay around and answer questions. Um, I'm just curious, uh, for a lot of these examples, you it was was it talking about like the 90 degrees? So if it's greater than 90, would it just take longer to process? Um, the Let's say I have this magnetization, I tip it beyond 90, it's still going to process, right? The magnetization always processes. So the frequency procession is going to be the same regardless of how I tip it, but it's just going to, um, you know, the recovery path is going gonna, is gonna to be a little different. Right, it's gonna start off from the, the procession in, in the in the um, transverse plane is gonna be the same, but it's, it's starting off at a different M sub Z. So then it still takes the same amount of time to recover because it's always the same time constant, but it's just starting at a different point. I see, okay, thank you. Yeah. I guess, I mean, uh, since Dr. McVeigh is on, do people have questions about the CT project that they want to talk with Professor McVeigh about then? <laughs>